Now, come on, let's give the Lord some praise. Come on, open up your mouth. Give him the fruit of your lips. Come on, open up your mouth. If you know that the Lord is worthy to be praised, if he brought you from a long ways, that you have no doubt in your mind that it's been God all the way, come on, open up your mouth and begin to give him the fruit of your lips. Lord, we praise you and we thank you now because you've been good to us, Lord. You've been kind to us, that you've looked over us, you've protected us, you've kept us, Lord, and we praise you. We open up our mouths, God, and we glorify your name. We give you glory this morning. And we thank you even now. Have your way today, Lord. Move in our midst, God. Stir us up. Strengthen us, Lord. Lift us to higher levels in you. In the name of Jesus. And God, we praise you for it even now. Come on, open up your mouth. And begin to thank him for what he's about to do in your life. Begin to thank him for how he's about to move upon your life. That you've come this morning because you need something from the Lord. That you need God to do something for you that only he can do. And as you open up your mouth to receive from the Lord, he's going to fill you up with everything that you need. That the enemy that have risen against you, the devil have come to fight you. That the devil is still a liar. Having obtained help from the Lord, I continue until this day. But I got a testimony that the Lord's been good. But I've been in trials and tribulations. Anybody know what I'm talking about? That you can lift your hand and say, God, you've been good, Lord. You've been kind and merciful, Lord. And I thank you on this morning. I made up in my mind when I came to the house of the Lord that if nobody else opened up their mouth, I was going to open up my mouth and tell them, Lord, I thank you. And I give you glory and praise because there's none like you in all of the heavens and all of the earth. And I thank you for your loving kindness, for your mercy that you show to me every day. And I know you're worthy, Jesus, of all of my praises. I don't know about nobody else, but I got a testimony of the goodness of the Lord. And I've learned how to give God a private praise in a public place. That's a praise that you don't know what I'm praising him about. It's a private praise that I'm lifting my hands. I'm in a public place, but I got a private praise. Because when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all of the things he's done for me, I got a reason to open up my mouth. I got a reason to praise him. Hallelujah. You ought to shout it out. I got a reason to praise him. I got a reason to bless his name. Now, God, we pray that your word will stir the hearts, lift, strengthen, heal, deliver, save, have your way as only you can do. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. It is good for me to be here, and it's good for us to be here. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord. That the fact that you are sitting here today is proof that you are a living miracle. That only you know all of the things that you've been through. That God has strengthened you and helped you to overcome trial and tribulation. Anybody know what I'm talking about? That you can say that you've been through something now. That you've had some hills and some valleys and some trials. But the Lord has been with us all the way and I'm so very thankful for his goodness to my friend and to my brother, to the angel of this house, the one and only Bishop Daryl Preaching Hines. <laughs> Bless you, my brother. Thank God for what you, for what you're doing, for what you've done, and for how you just continue to press your way. We thank God for that. To your lovely wife in her absence. Bless the woman of God. Bless the woman of God. In fact, to all of the Heinz family, God bless you. I said, my God, that man moved like his daddy up here. Talking about the glory of the Lord. And thank God for the elders that assisted me and came with me. Put your hands together for them. Elder Edwards, Elder Austin, my wife in her absence, we thank God for her. She would have been here with me today. But her mother is in our home, uh, convalescing, and she's taking care of mom. I think that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? You're going to get older. I don't care what you say. 
somewhere on the line, you're going to need somebody to take care of you. And so we honor her in her absence. Uh, if you'll come with me now to a very familiar passage of scripture, uh, the 23rd Psalms. Very, very seldom have I ministered from these type of particular texts because it is the third most popular uh, scripture in the biblical text. The third most popular, John 3.16 being the first, Jeremiah 29, 11 being the second, and this is the third most. So oftentimes I don't pull out the text that people read because it's been preached and talked about and shared and so forth and so on. But as I was, as I was seeking the Lord, he laid this on my heart. This, this strong text to which David writes that we read about that have blessed the hearts of men for years and years and years. And here we are again in Psalms 23. That declares that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restored my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou prepared the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointed my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Verse number six, as he closed this, closes this out, he says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Forever. Mm. Uh, look at someone and tell them I'm living with goodness and mercy. Just tell them goodness and mercy is with me. We understand that David writes this. We know that he is a shepherd. So as he refers to Christ or to God, as he refers to God as his shepherd, he speaks from his frame of reference. You do understand that you see life through your frame of reference. That we all have what we know to be perspective. But perspective changes from person to person. Uh, and, and so uh, perspective is like this. You're watching me. And if I were to ask you what you see, you would describe the screens behind me, perhaps the podium and other things that you see on the stage. But if you asked me what I see, I would say a congregation, flags behind you, and things you cannot see. You would share with, you, with me your perspective. I would share with you my perspective. Both perspectives would be true, but they would not be exact. Because the exact of the room is everything that is in the room. You cannot share everything that is in the room because your back is to the wall, my back is to the stage. Uh, and so as people share their perspective, they share it from the way that they live and the way that they view life. Uh, you, you know, we learn as we grow. Uh, a baby learns perspective. A child learns certain things, experiences teach us. For example, the mother tells the little baby, he says, don't go in the kitchen. When I turn the stove off, the stove is hot. Curious child. Three or four years old want to know what's going on with the stove. Doesn't have a really a frame of reference of what happens with a hot stove. The child has never experienced touching a hot stove. And so out of curiosity, when he, the mother leaves the room, he goes over to the stove out of curiosity because he has no frame of reference, no perspective. Touches that stove and screams and hollers. Mama comes in there and he had his little hand up crying. And the next morning, she's in the kitchen cooking. She said, come in. He said, no, stove hot, stove hot. His frame of reference. So David shares from his frame of reference when he declares, the Lord is my shepherd. Because he understood what shepherdhood was. Uh, he understands that God is his provider, his way maker. He leadeth me. He guides me. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, which shows the provision of God. But I want you to look at scripture or verse number six, because this word, surely, he says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. 
Surely here not only represents God's promise and his assurance, but it exposes God's favor. It is recorded in the biblical text some 278 times. The word surely represents God's covenant for our lives. Uh, it is to say that I am certain that God will act on my behalf and him acting on my behalf allows others to see his favor on my life. Genesis chapter 6, we know the Bible says that corruption had come upon the world. And the Bible said that God found, God, uh, Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord, found the favor of God. And that God instructed him that men would come to see the favor on his life. Surely means without doubt and beyond question. It simply means that this will certainly happen. So even before uh, goodness takes place, we're introduced to the favor of God. I want to tell you there's something about life, it changes. I don't care who you are. I don't care how saved you are. I don't care if you're so saved, you levitate in the middle of your room at night. And you wake up in the morning speaking in tongues. I don't care if you blink your eyes and the angels is in the shower with you. When your feet touch the ground and you go to living, you're going to face some situations and you're going to go through some unexpected stuff. But when the favor of God is on you, it is pronounced. That here, favor is pronounced in this particular text. That, that, that the writer David wants to make it plain, surely, that without doubt, God sees where I am. Aren't you glad about that? Aren't you grateful that God can see where you are? Because sometimes people can be around you, be next to you, and never know where you are. Uh, people can be in your circumference. They can be uh, where you are. They can live in the same space and not know what you're going through. So many people have lived their lives. Uh, I was talking to a young man the other day, a high schooler that was sharing with me. I prayed for him because one of his classmates committed suicide. He said he was the most popular person in the school. He was a football player, and he led in his class, and everybody loved him. He was jovial, had come from a wealthy family, was living well, but nobody knew where he was. But when you understand that God knows all about me, he knows where I am, and he understands the things that I face that I can't explain to you. Surely, surely, the favor of the Lord, the favor that God puts on your life, the unmerited kindness of God. Listen, you better be glad that God don't have a committee that vote whether or not he's going to bless you. you. You better be glad there ain't a group of people that got to make a decision about your next blessing and where your next blessing comes from. Because when God has something for you, it don't matter who don't like you, who not standing in your corner, who don't think you can get it. Who can't see you with it when God has something for you? That if God be for you, who can be against you? This word surely is so powerful. We first see the word surely in the book of Genesis, the second chapter, when God told Adam that if he ate of the tree that was in the midst of the garden, he would surely die. Genesis 2 and 17. That word surely now becomes covenant. That it becomes covenant. That the word surely becomes covenant in your life. That when God has said something, the word that comes out of his mouth makes covenant with your life. When he has made me promise, listen, some people are not going to understand what God has promised your life. And some promises are going to seem to be impossible. But God promised Abraham a son. The Bible says that Abraham had a son at 100 years old. And that Sarah was 90 years old. Now you know that's something else. Because if Sarah and Abraham showed up at church this morning and Sarah was walking down the aisle pregnant, we'd have to pause the service. Because all of y'all would put out your phones. It would be viral. They, I thought they was lying. You ain't going to believe this. I'm sitting here at church. Girl, she coming down the aisle right now, pregnant as could be. And in spite of all impossibilities, the Bible says in Romans 4 that Abraham was fully persuaded that what God had promised him, he was able to perform it. He had that surely, that covenant that God comes to give you in your life. That in spite of what the enemy does to fight against you, surely, surely, surely. 
1 Peter 5 and 8 says to be sober and vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Job 1, uh, the Bible says that the sons of God came in before God and Satan came with them and God asked them, where have you been? He says, I've been up and down. I've been to and fro. I'm looking for opportunities. But when the enemy comes to fight your life, surely the favor of God is there to give you what you need to sustain what you face. Because if he doesn't give you what you need to sustain what you face, I don't care how much you know, how many friends you have, what you have accumulated, it will not be enough. But because I have God's favor, it is not earned. You didn't, you didn't get this because you've been in church 20 years. Get that straight. You didn't get this because you're an advent faster. You didn't get this because you know the biblical text. You got it because in spite of all of who you are, he loved you in spite of yourself. But there was nothing that you could have done to earn this favor. Be surely that God comes to give us, but because he loves us to such degree. He loves man so much that the angels ask the question, who is man that thou art so mindful of him? But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever shall believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Here God's word brings Adam into covenant. And he establishes his word. And when Adam sins, we see the fulfillment of that covenant. Surely is God's favor. Genesis 18, 18 says, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation. And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. The promise of God. Uh, Psalms 140 and 13. Surely the righteous shall give thanks unto thy name. And the upright shall dwell in thy presence. Hallelujah. Hebrews 6 and 13 and 14 says. For when God made promise to Abraham. Because he could swear by no greater. He swear by himself saying. Surely blessing I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply you. So as David pins this particular text, he starts out by saying, surely goodness, 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 goodness. Somebody say goodness. Mm. Goodness in the Hebrew text is shin. It's spelled in the English C-H-E-N. But this goodness, this goodness that we're talking about, it's more than just charity. <laughs> This goodness of God is more than just simple charity, but it's the active power of God in your life to move. It is the Shekinah glory of the Lord. The word Shekinah in the biblical text is not found. You will not find the word Shekinah, but the word Shekinah means the active power or the active presence of God. We know that God is present everywhere, but he's not active everywhere. He's everywhere observing all things, but he's not moving to bless everywhere. His Shekinah glory is not everywhere. That, that the God spoke to Moses, and when God spoke to Moses and declared, I'm going to lead you, he led him by a pillar of cloud in the daytime. That was the Shekinah glory. A pillar of fire by night, that was the Shekinah glory. When Solomon built the temple of the Lord, and the Bible said they came in and worshiped the Lord, that the spirit of the Lord was so in the room that the Bible said that the priest could not minister because of the presence of the Lord, the Shekinah glory of the Lord. That goodness represents the glory of God, the Shekinah power that moved the active power of God to move upon my life when I need him. I want to tell you that when he speaks this word or these words, uh, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. He was not just talking about goodness and mercy walking behind you. Uh, he was not just even talking about goodness and mercy pursuing you. But he was saying goodness and mercy is active daily in my life. But it is a part of, day of my daily living. His goodness and his mercy is a part of my day. I need his goodness and his mercy. Why? Because there are moments where you will make the wrong decisions. After you pray. <laughs> there are moments where stuff will happen in your life and unless goodness and mercy can come in in spite of where you are, you will find yourself entangled by the corruption of the enemy but because goodness and mercy, they're active day in my life to meet me wherever I am. God can't help you if he can't meet you where you are. He can't do nothing for you if he can't meet you where you are. That, that, that's like you going to, to get an operation from the doctor and they put a mechanic in the room. 
You ain't going to need the Holy Ghost to tell him to stop. He's got to meet you where you are. Goodness, the goodness of the Lord. The goodness of the Lord. This word is represented some 48 times in the word of the Lord. Exodus 18 and 9. And Jephthah rejoiced for all the goodness which the Lord had done to Israel. And when he had delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians, that the goodness of the Lord shows up in our life. Exodus 33 and 19, and he said, I will make all my goodness to pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. That God says, I'll show mercy to whom I want to show it to. I'll show my goodness to whom I want to show it to. You might not think that the person qualifies. That's why he didn't ask you. You might not think that the person shouldn't get it. That's why he didn't come to you. He says, my mercy and my goodness is my choice to pour it on whoever I choose to pour it on. But Paul writes in Ephesians 1 and 11 and says, God moves by the counsel of his own will. But nobody governs him, but he moves by the counsel of his own will. But he told Cyrus in uh, Isaiah 45, when Cyrus was anointed by God to be the deliverer of Israel against Babylon, but he was a Zoroastrian who believed in two gods. He thought it was a god of evil and a god of good. And God told him, he says, I'm God all by myself. There is none beside me. And then God told him, I created both evil and good. You can't get around God. It's God's choice to bless your life. And when God declares goodness on your life. Your mama don't have to like you. Your friends can walk away from you. When God declares the goodness of the life, your life, when he says, surely goodness, goodness, goodness. There's some things, if you're honest with, that have happened to you that's been good that you can't even explain. We often highlight what went wrong in our life, but it's some good stuff that have happened to us. It's some stuff that you didn't buy, you didn't earn. You were short in the grocery store, $25, and the person behind you pulled it out and paid for your groceries. Uh, somebody came along to do you harm, and God stepped in and was preventative in your life. Stuff was going wrong, and at the same time stuff was going wrong, God says, I'm going to make sure stuff go good. That's why Paul writes in Romans 8 and 28, for all things are working together for the good to them that love the Lord are the called according to his purpose because goodness and mercy. Tell somebody goodness and mercy are a part of my life. David says in 27, 13, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord. In the land of the living. I would have fainted if his goodness wasn't there. I know you saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. With a burning fire and smoke follow you where you're going. But I want to talk about when stuff go wrong. I don't know about you, but in my life, I had some stuff go wrong. And it looked like it all went wrong all at the same time. I was praying, God, if it's got to happen, can we put it in intervals? Can we make something happen this year and something happen two years later? I don't understand why it got to happen all the time, all at once. But in the midst of every trial, I faced goodness and mercy was there to cuff me, to tuck me, to keep me, to guide me, to hold me. It's goodness. Mercy, in the Hebrew, is pronounced Rahman. It means, literally, it means wound. In the Hebrew, it means wound. It is reflective of a mother carrying a child, bearing a child, that in the process of bearing a child, even before the child is born, mercy is shown to the child that she is carrying. That she is caring for this baby before it ever comes into the world. <laughs> I want to tell you, mercy on your life is no mistake. That, that long before you ever came into the existence of the world, mercy was overlooking your life. That's why you're still here. <laughs> That's why you survived the stuff that you went through. You, you weren't all that good now. It was just that mercy was there to navigate you through difficult things in your life. And when we see that God has done what he's done, he said to Jeremiah, I knew you before you was born. Do you understand how miraculous that is? 
Do you understand how great a miracle you are today? Uh, the last big lottery was like two billion. The odds was, I think they said 262 million to one. Were the odds of winning that lottery? But do you know that when a man spills seed, 300 million seeds are released, and only one seed, that's you. <laughs> Only out of 300 million seed that was spilled, here you are sitting in here today. I know you've been slow all your life, but you wasn't slow to end. <laughs> and here it is, God made sure that you came into the earth realm. And he declared mercy going to be over you every step of the way. That when the enemy comes in to consume you. That when the spirit of the enemy come in as a flood, I'll raise up a standard in them and I'll show you I'm a present help in the time of trouble. David said, I once was young, but now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor God see begging for bread. I want to tell you that you're living with goodness and with mercy now. Ah, that he comes to provide for you the hand of his mercy. Uh, in the New Testament, mercy is presented as forgiveness. That we see Jesus being a merciful savior and forgiving man for all of his sin. That as wrong as man had been and all of the corruption that was in his life, uh, that Jesus comes along filled with mercy now. The Bible says, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. You need mercy in your life now. You need God to help you and to guide you. I don't care how well things may seem to be, you need mercy. Bishop, I had someone say to me, he said, Pastor, I'm as clean as Clorox. I said, man, that's mighty clean. Two years later, he asked me to fill out some documents because he had gone through something mental. And uh, he had sweats at night and was waking up in the middle of the night screaming and hollering and going through some changes. I realized that clean uh, is based on perspective. <laughs> Is really based on perspective. You clean to yourself. But when you really stop to examine who you are and what you've been through. Uh, David says, cleanse thou me from my secret faults, my presumptuous sins. I, 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 goodness and mercy has to be active in your life daily because of the stuff that you get into. <laughs> It's got to be active in your life daily to help you get through the stuff you created because all the stuff that happened in your life wasn't created by everybody else. You got some stuff that happened in your life that was created because of what you did, what you said, and how you acted. And what I love so much about God is even when it's my fault, even when I, he got a reason to look at me and say no, he has released goodness and mercy. That mercy steps in and says, I know that he's guilty. I know that she is guilty, but Jesus, let me remind you, you were wounded for their transgressions. You were bruised for their iniquities that the chastisement of your peace was upon them and with the chastisement of his peace was upon you and with your stripes uh, they declared the healing in their life. Uh, I want to tell you that the only reason you are sitting here today is because God's been good to you now. There are moments where we got to stop and reflect. I, I, I don't like to be around people who like to pretend all the time. Like to act like they ain't never been through nothing, never cried, never got angry, never got upset. I I can't be around them people because I'm going to tell you the truth. I didn't have people make me mad. They didn't make me upset. And I told the Lord a few times, Lord, I ain't got nothing but about 30 seconds and all of who I am is going to rise up. Because I'm like Popeye. I have done had all eyes can take. And eyes ain't going to take no more. With Jesus living in my life, eyes ain't going to take no more. You're going to have to help God because I feel a Negro rising up in me. I'm talking about me. I ain't talking about you. I'm telling you now, I know that I need the help of the Lord. But I want to tell you when goodness and mercy, he says, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That goodness and mercy is involved in my life. Now, now when you read this particular text, he says, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. All the days of my life mean that my life has ended. It has been with me until my life ends. And then he states, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He pins this particular text a thousand years before Jesus is born. 
um, before Jesus uh, ever stands before his disciples that, 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 that David pins this particular text, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Uh, people have assumed that it meant the house of God because we know how much he appreciated the house of God even though he was not able to build the house of God. Uh, but when you read this text, he says, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. End. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How do you dwell in the house of the Lord forever unless it is something eternal? That before Jesus had ever written to his disciples, I go away to prepare a place for you, that where I am there you may be also in my father's house. I mean, he mentions, if it were not so, I would have told you David had already had a glimpse of the house of the Lord, of the goodness of the Lord. And when my life ends, goodness is still going to be with me because I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let me finish here. I want to tell you that you've been up against some stuff but the devil comes to minimize you. He wants to feel, you to feel like you can't accomplish what God told you that belongs to you. Your problem is you have measured yourself against other people. He has highlighted your failures because he doesn't want you to understand your strengths now. But I come to tell you that God's been with you every step of the way. That his goodness and his mercy huh, have been there to guide your life. I don't know about you, huh, but I I can reflect in my life of some stuff that God have done for me. Is there anybody here that can reflect on the goodness of the Lord? Sometimes you got to go back and look at the landscape of your life and recognize the trial that you've been through and see how God pulled you out of stuff. Sometimes we went in the opposite direction of the choice that God had for our lives. We was like Jonah trying to run from the Lord. But I come to tell you, you can't run from the Lord because Jonah turns around and says from the belly of hell uh, cried I that even when he had found himself uh, in a position that he had caused himself uh, he got himself in it but God got him out of it uh, I come to tell you I got me in it but God can get me out uh, you got you in it but God can get you out uh, because of his goodness and his mercy uh, the enemy wants to slow you down he wants to bring you to a halt uh, he comes to fill your life with chaos uh, he comes to corrupt the things around you so that he can interrupt your focus. Uh, he don't want you to believe that God is going to fulfill everything that he has promised you. Uh, but I come to tell you on this morning, surely uh, that the sureness of God, uh, the promises of God are yea and amen. Uh, and it don't matter who don't like you and who don't want to stand with you. Uh, doesn't matter how long you've been misunderstood. Uh, that when God has something for you, uh, he's got a time, a season uh, to which he declares that it's coming to pass in your life. Uh, you need to tell somebody it's coming to pass in my life uh, sometimes people are watching your life uh, they know the events of your life but they don't know the person uh, they judge you by the events but they don't know the person uh, they see the what is but they don't understand the who is uh, they watch things happen in your life uh, they saw you lose and they saw the things that happened uh, that were negative in your life uh, and declared that you couldn't rise above it uh, because they followed the events in your life uh, but I come to tell you when God puts his hand on your life uh, and even those things may happen in your life uh, for the Bible declared that the footsteps of a good man uh, are ordered by the Lord uh, but he delighteth in his way uh, but you gotta keep on reading uh, and though he utterly fall uh, he will not be destroyed uh, because the hand of the Lord upholdeth him uh, I come to tell you this morning uh, that the devil don't want you to recognize uh, that goodness and mercy have been walking with you all the days of your life when you were in the street in the world when trouble touched your money and you couldn't see your way out of your trial I come to tell you that God had already assigned goodness and mercy to be a part of your daily living and I come to thank him this morning because I can remember where he brought me from you ought to look at somebody and ask them neighbor do you remember where he brought you from all of the things uh, that he's done for me uh, I don't know about nobody else but I've had some nights when uh, I didn't cry sometime uh, I cried the whole night uh, it seemed like the burdens uh, were too hard for me to bear uh, but I come to understand uh, he's a God uh, that answers prayer uh, he's a God that delivers uh, and he'll hear your humble cry uh, and when uh, you call on the name of the Lord uh, and people have left you standing by yourself goodness and mercy 
will step in where you are and give you the strength to keep on going. I come to tell you, it wasn't your knowledge that got you where you are. It wasn't your CDs, the money you got in the bank. It wasn't your friends, and it wasn't your influence. It was when you didn't have nothing to grab a hold of, and the love of God released goodness and mercy. It was when you did not know what to do next, and goodness and mercy stepped in your life. I'm so glad goodness and mercy have been with me every day of my life. If there ain't anybody here that know that the goodness of the Lord have helped you today, I come to tell you now that there are times when the devil come against you because he fought you through your family, fought you through your finances, fought you on your job, touched your body and made you sick because what the devil desired to do was cut off your praise. He wanted to interrupt your interactiveness with God that comes through blessing him and giving him glory. But when you learn how to praise him with tears running down your eyes, when you learn how to give him the glory when your friends are gone, when you don't think you can make it to the next week and you begin to give God the glory, that's when goodness and mercy rises to take you to a whole nother level. I come to tell you, goodness is with me. You better tell somebody, neighbor, goodness is with me. I might have to cry, but goodness is holding me. You ever been there before where it looked like you on the edge of life? Come on, close to me. I don't know how y'all gonna do this, but you better hold me. I ain't no little man. If I hit this floor, they're gonna see it. And if I get up, the message's gonna change. Have you ever been there before? Hold me. Where you were hanging on the edge of life and it didn't look like you were going to come out on top. Have you ever been there before? Ooh, where people were watching you, waiting for you to fail and waiting for you to fall. Hanging on the edge of life. Didn't have enough money to buy your way out have enough friends uh, to help you get out of it. Uh, but when I, uh, when I uh, was hanging on uh, the edge of life, uh, I would have fell, uh, but goodness uh, and mercy, uh, it held me uh, when I uh, was on the edge of life. Uh, and all of a sudden, uh, God said, goodness, uh, mercy, get him, uh, get him off of the edge, uh, get him off of the edge. Uh, he'd been on the edge long enough I come to tell you you better tell somebody I'm coming off the edge I'm coming off the edge goodness and mercy I've been hanging on the edge of life but God is giving me just what I need I come to tell you everything you better tell somebody your hands he didn't bring you this far for you to fail you have measured the can't be and the can be was in the room right there with you you have dealt with the weight 
carrying your family. Trying to really move ahead and not understanding where all these roadblocks come from. What do you do if you gave everything you know to give and it's not enough? The enemy wants to minimize you. But I come to tell you this morning that God is about to expose the greatness in your life. There's a part of you that your mama don't even know about that God is getting ready to expose. When we purchased the building where we are, we had to build the parking lot. I know you know about that, Bishop. And when we were doing the parking lot, it was nothing but gravel. It was, they made us put these little islands that have trees in them. The whole place was under construction. And one day we walked outside and there was a watermelon growing in a strange place. It was a watermelon. You know how we do. Somebody walked out of the dining hall eating watermelon, spit the seed. Somebody not knowing stepped on it and pushed it further enough for it to take root. The enemy stepped on you and never expected for you to take root. This watermelon grew in a strange place. It didn't grow in a watermelon patch with other watermelons. It was growing all by itself. It, it wasn't planted in a nurtured environment. Yeah, but goodness said, if they step on you and push you down, I'm going to make you grow. <laughs> Mercy said, if they push you in the ground, I'm going I'm to make you grow. Ah, God says, listen, this is a season. I'm getting ready to make you grow. And we were astonished to see this watermelon. And the apostle said, don't nobody touch it. Leave it alone. Let it, let it grow to maturity. Because God says, there's a season. I'm going to make the devil get up off of you. There's a season I'm going to tell the devil enough is enough is enough is enough. I allowed you to grow in a strange place so that I could expose my glory. I allowed you to grow in a strange place. I let you be talked about. I let people point fingers at you. I let you go through criticism so at the end of what I do, everybody will know. And I've been with you every step of the way. And when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. Lift your hands. Don't, 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 don't let failure navigate your next movement. Don't, don't let what has happened Declare what won't happen. Because as I read this and read through the text, y'all know David was a mess, right? <laughs> but with God's hand on him, impossible things became possible. And that's what's getting ready to happen to you. Impossible things are getting ready to be possible. Jesus said, the door I open, no man can shut it. And what I'm getting ready to do for you that nobody calculated. See, the devil calculated your failure, but he didn't calculate your favor. And because favor is on me, he is navigating my life. Lift your hands. I'm finished. Jesus is the center of my joy. He's the center of your joy. I don't know what you need him to do. But I want you to reach up. Tell God what you need. Jesus, 
You're the center of my joy. And all that's good and perfect comes from you. You're the heart of my contentment. Hope for all I do. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Come on. Come on, help me. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. All that's good and perfect comes from you. Oh, you're the heart of my contentment. Lord, you hope for all I do. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. I want you to talk to the Lord right now. Tell him what you need. Oh, Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. All that's good, perfect, Jesus. I know that it comes from you. Oh, you're the heart, my contentment. Lord, you hope for all I do. Let me hear you say, Jesus, you are center of my joy. Jesus. You are center of my joy, Jesus. Everything I need is in you, Jesus. I believe, oh, Jesus. You are center of my joy. And Lord, in the name of Jesus, I thank you. Put your hand on yourself. I'm coming against every force that have come against you. Everything that have come to detain, hinder, interrupt, block, stop. Everything that come to sit on your dream. Everything that come to kill your drive. I'm coming against it in the name of Jesus. And just like that watermelon that grew in a strange place, you're getting ready to rise. But God sent me from Chicago this morning to tell you that he is unlimited. And he's got more than enough to meet what you need. That he sent me here to tell you this morning that in spite of everything you face, that there are greater things just ahead of you. That you have limited yourself. And God says, I'm getting ready to take you now to an unlimited space. I'm getting ready to move for you. I'm going to touch your children, your grandchildren. I'm getting ready to move in your home. I'm getting ready to touch your body. I'm getting ready to pour into your life. I'm getting ready to multiply what you got in your hands. God is getting ready to do the unexpected. Put your hand on yourself. And God, I thank you right now for your mighty hand that delivers. Thank you for your anointing. Touch even now. Move as only you can do. And I thank you for it right now. I thank you for miracles right now. Open your mouth and say, Lord, I thank you for releasing miracles in my life. Said with me, and I declare even before the end of this year, that I will see your mighty hand moving on all of who I am. And everything I need, I thank you for supplying it. Come on, give the Lord some praise.